E aí, Alice? Ela, ela... de sua preferência. Perguntas aos autores podem ser enviadas durante toda a transmissão por meio da caixa de comentários do YouTube. Ao final do encontro, algumas delas serão feitas aos convidados. Boa, Flip! Bom início de noite! 
Welcome this evening, everyone who's here in the 19th flip, the Parachi International Literary Festival. I want to thank the organizers for the invitation to chair this roundtable on such an inspiring topic with two major inspirations for me. The event means so much and has grown with me in this city in the middle of Nyeri, the Atlantic Forest here in Parachi. I'm Alice. I'm a specialist, a self-taught specialist in non-conventional food plants and a founder of Organicity, a company which acts in network supporting people to regenerate environments through growing food biodiversity and cultivating it. It's a huge joy for me to welcome here Jorge Ferreira, who is a great master and teacher and is always supporting us in this journey of the mushrooms, edible mushrooms, and teaching me that it's possible in urban environments as well for us to find them. So Jorge Ferreira is one of the references in Brazil in the identification a gathering and consumption of spontaneous food species. He, Carmelita Alves and Jose Ferreira, his parents, one of the precursors of agroforestry in Brazil. He grew up in the San Jose farm, growing forests, food forests in the Atlantic forest. Ever since he was a young child, he observed his family discovering the way that they lived with the uh, profusion of trees and diversity of colors animals and fungi. Hence, his knowledge called attention of great specialists in the field. And today, he is a reference for all Brazilian universities and is a guide for experiences and contact leading several different projects which encourage this biodiversity, which we can eat, but uh, ends up not consuming it entirely. So over the course of these 15 years, you got involved with environmental education projects, sustainability, and valuing territory of Kaisada culture. George teaches us that mushrooms, in addition to food, can be medicine and everything that we need is to access this information is when we walk with him through the forest and can witness the experience of this being, which apparently appears to feel the presence of these fantastic fungi. So in addition to all this experience, Georgie has experience of having grown up in the Atlantic forest, and he's gonna share this with us all this wealth. Good evening, Alice. How are you doing? It's a huge pleasure. And I'm grateful to Flip for the invitation, the entire team. And you made such great effort and organized this for us to be talking here and sharing our knowledge. And I'm very grateful for the affectionate way that you introduced me. It's very special and friendly. The way that the universe conspired or where I was brought up with my parents and with a more sensitive view to all this wealth, which is Brazil, which is a biodiversity, the Brazilian biomes, where I'm part of the Atlantic forest biome. And it's very satisfying, pleasurable to understand that this biome always surrounds us the largest number of Brazilians live in this biome, inhabiting this biome and extracting from it their food and the resources for their daily lives. But oftentimes we still deny and uh, ignore the ways, the harmonious ways of their interaction. And this, in fact, we still have much to do and much to share, educating, and work on this. So it's a dynamic way of this is to use car courses, walks, treks. And I love all these projects. And I think that we learn with emotion. And I truly moved in my daily experience here where I was brought up. And perhaps all the knowledge that it's not knowledge, but 
it is knowledge, but life experience has been acquired with great emotion. I sleep and wake up with, and I'm moved with great emotion to know that around me there's so much wealth to be discovered still, and so much even paradigm shifts and challenges of human beings and understanding this can be part of us. Nature is not separate from us. We are part of it. And the fungi are beings which show this interaction, you know, how the way they're connected to everything and to everyone. And of course, we can be alert to this. It's a fantastic world, truly is. Every day, I'm more dazzled by this kingdom. I realized the, how much we should vibrate in this network form as they work and humans should connect much more to this network shape and form where everything is connected in pursuit of favoring and flourishing because that's what's happened the more the mycela spread more mushrooms sprout and we humans should copy them their intelligence and understand this way this beautiful and poetic way of being and be inspired by them to create technology and ways of inhabiting. So that's basically the nutshell, the way of life that I see this place with the fungi. And my love comes from the fact that working with agroforestry, it was agroforestry systems that taught me to work with mushrooms. I thought, I thought that would be great to share that. Did you want to say something? I'm going to ask you, uh, we had this doubt, and I want to be able to receive him and to talk with you to begin the conversation. That's great. So if you don't know him, Merlin Sheldrake is a discoverer of the world of invisible beings dating back to his childhood in the studies on the science of plants, microbiology, ecology, and philosophy of science. All of them pointed to a kind of common organism, fungi. And it's curious, a deep interest in this kingdom shaped the life of this young biologist that graduated from Cambridge University and the uh, entangled life that he's launching here in Brazil he tells in his book how he when he was still an undergraduate student, he made alcoholic beverages from medieval uh, recipes and how he began to search in the forest for specimens, specimens that would be investigated in a laboratory. His book, recently published in Brazil, Entangled Life is not just a set by the author on the psychedelic experiences with psilocybin with magic mushrooms but it's also a point of reflection. It's an, an enchantment. And if you haven't read Entangled Life, read it. It's now out in Portuguese. The message that emerges from the, is unequivocal. The fungi are responsible for conceiving life on earth. And the dis recent discovery of these processes makes the message urgent. In this sense, uh, that book takes a double task, although it, all, while it attests to the fundamental role of mushrooms in this entanglement of relations that sustains life on Earth, the book provokes the readers to imagine how the mushrooms have the idea and the respect for what can be human behavior uh, given the climate crisis. A dedicated gaze by Merlin Sheldrake towards the world of my Sela, uh, we have much to learn from that. Welcome, Merlin. It's an honor and pleasure to welcome you here to Parachi. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. I'm um, the, the the translation is a bit um, patchy, so I'm not sure whether you asked me a question or not. It wasn't a question, that was a commentary and a welcoming 
welcoming remarks to welcome you here to the FLIP, the Parachi Festival. Great. Just to welcome you. Great, but it's wonderful to be here and um, thanks for having me in this. Um, uh, an honor to be here with um, these distinguished panelists and um, and for this wonderful event. I look forward to our conversation. Can you hear the translation okay, Merlin? No, I'm not hearing anything. I've got it set to English, but I can't hear the translation. Can you can't hear the translation? Hello, we're testing the mm -hmm. translation. I'm going to begin with a question for you, after which turn the same question over to Merlin, which is how does your journey reach the university of the the universe of the fungi? If you could tell us a little bit about that. Okay. Yes, it's a huge pleasure, Berlin. Welcome. It's great to share this time with you. It's an honor for us. Alice, answering your question, the fungi in my life were the path that I trod with the practice of agriculture and farming, working on the land, the soil, and managing the forest, and understood that there was a huge distance and lack of knowledge on the part of the peoples who live in from farming and farmers and others. And I saw mushrooms in my daily activity, but I saw that people fear mushrooms, feared mushrooms. I was already curious about, always curious about not only fungi, but all plants, wild plants, leaves, birds, like and everything that I found in front of me. I was always curious about them, water beings in the water and everything in the mushrooms. I always saw those beautiful colors in the mushrooms and I wanted to challenge myself to understand the mushrooms. The first resource that I found was to photograph them. I loved photograph. I began to photograph the mushrooms with photograph and I recorded until I got a collection of 160 species until one day I showed it to a friend and he said, dude, you did a huge uh, catalog of mushrooms. This is nine years ago, a lot of important species. There may be some edible ones and medicinal, medicinal mushrooms in your list and it was attempting to catalog them and attempting to determine their, more than determine their function. I wasn't really concerned about their actual function. I had access to the first material on the fungal kingdom. It was in English, the first guidebook. And I began to differentiate according to their genera. And I found that there were some that had medicinal properties. The first species was Picompolum sanguinea. It's widely used. Urupe, it's known by indigenous peoples as Urupe in Brazil. It's been used as a medicinal mushroom. It's an antibiotic and antifungal. It's, it's an incredible species and with some of the natural pigments as well and for painting and coloring a lot of things. So I began to my look at this place that has a food potential, medicinal potential and working with gastronomy. I already worked with gastronomy all before. I said, that's, I'm gonna take this path. And the first ones that I began to eat were the most basic edible mushrooms, the simplest ones, oh, the uh, Jewish ear. And I was always charmed by them and the collective grew and the path expanded as you approach and collect the, and create a collective of people. I think that the urge to learn more increases and it represented understanding that all the process of incorporation of biomass and uh, organic matter in the forest is responsible for transforming wood into soil. It's the fungi that are responsible for that. I brought an example. This is a stick. That was recently pruned. It's called inga. It's besides the species that I always use to to use for pruning in agroforestry. Uh, mushrooms always sprouted 
whenever I pruned trees, this awakened an entire world for me, a potential. I cataloged 60 more species, photographed, observing them, and 30 more species, collecting wild species. But the beginning began with that. I was always very curious, and they were very present in my life, the mushrooms. That's fantastic. You've been growing uh, mushrooms, inducing mushroom production. And I love doing this with kids, taking children to observe these mechanism of the mycela growing on the trunk, and producing mushrooms. I'd like to do this dynamic pedagogical activity with the children. I think it's fantastic. And it's precisely the place where I believe that to touch the sensitive place of and perceive the intelligence of human beings, but it's another diversity for our daily food, medicinal, cultural practices, and artistic practices. The uh, sky is the limit for these beings who can inspire us. Merlin, would you like to tell us a little bit about your path and how you reached mushrooms? on your life path? Yes. Um, <clears throat> so when I was small, I was very interested in how things transform. How does one thing change into another? I would take baskets of kitchen waste into the garden and put them in the compost heap. And then a few months later, I'd go there and I would uh, shovel out soil and put it on the garden and then um, plant plants and plants would can grow from the soil that had been originally the plants in my kitchen. Um, and so I asked questions um, about how does these transformative processes take place and um, and at some point it was explained to me that um, microbes, these invisibly small organisms with a great power to change one thing into another uh, were responsible uh, and fungi were very uh, important types of uh, decomposing organism. And so I became interested in how it was that such powerful organisms could be, um, could, could conduct all these processes, but out of my sight. How could such a, a powerful um, um, ability be so invisible? And so um, I became curious and, uh, and thought more and more about, uh, about these processes. Then later on, um, that was a kind of decomposition angle. Um, I was also interested in mushrooms. I would see mushrooms growing. I'd see them grow. You know, I'd go out in the forest and there would be mushrooms uh, one day and there hadn't been mushrooms the day before. Uh, and so I became um, intrigued at how fast they were able to grow compared to plants and then how, um, how they would just seem to disappear for the rest of the year. Um, but later on, I became interested in symbiosis, how different organisms have found uh, ways to live alongside one another, to support each other's uh, needs, um, to collaborate, to compete, uh, to cooperate with each other. Um, and um, then my formal study of fungi began, uh, studying mycorrhizal fungi, which form symbiotic relationships with plants. And, um, and then it just spiraled deeper and deeper like so many people the more I find out about fungi the more I want to find out about fungi the more I learn the more I realize I don't know um, and so I just fall um, fall deeper and deeper into the uh, fungal uh, inquiry It's like the only certain that we certainty that we have is when we enter this universe is that we're going to know less and less. We discover how little we know. I have a question also for both of you, which I think that is picks up on this the rest of this conversation, which I think it's amazing the, how long we as humankind took to acknowledge this life, this amount of life which exists under our feet, literally speaking. And so I'd like to know how you believe that this can transform the knowledge that we have of ourselves. Jorge, would you like to answer that one? Tell us a little bit. Okay, I believe in the fact that 
this intelligence that happens is a subtle intelligence and also at the same time it's subtle i think that the word that comes to mind and that it can inspire us to be more sensitive to understand the whole and it's this interaction between the degree to which fungi are connected in fact and make the connection between plants and all the process that happens in the transformation of the soil and others uh, there's mycorrhizal fungi they're on the roots of the trees and at the same time they're interacting with conduction processes and assisting in the entire context of the plant i was just planting a seed now uh, mycorrhizal seed making this combination of seeds with mycorrhizal fungi and this can show us how life can be much more organic in this interaction that we should have and at the same time understand that there's nobody more important human beings uh, take this place that together we are the power we together and we're able to conquer what we need for life for quality of life for human well-being and not by competition although there is in nature this is not just something that's like a paradise they also compete there's that kind of but there's much more by per, per square foot much more life in nature than what we are able to generate and human beings we still need to learn much more from them i think there's a lot of the, we want a lot of space for ourselves we need to share our space more humans want too much space for themselves this potential that what can teach us much this, about this place and it's quite spiritual That's a great tip on concepts of spirituality. Merlin? Well, <clears throat> I think that there's um, much of our discovery about fungi and microbes and the ways that the living world is interconnected by these organisms is, uh, in one sense, it's discovery because we have new techniques, new technologies that allow us to see things that we couldn't see before, that allow us to make observations um, that were simply impossible. So in one sense, this is discovery, but in another sense, it's kind of remembering, because I think in many traditional knowledge systems, um, it was clear that the living world was bound up, uh, made up of intimate reciprocal relations, that everything um, is connected in some way. Um, and the process of um, the Enlightenment revolution in, in, in thinking and um, the emergence of the modern sciences and all sorts of other uh, factors have led us into a very reductive mechanistic perspective where we try to understand things by breaking them up into their parts to see them as neatly bounded individuals, uh, including ourselves. Um, but I think probably to many people um, living before the Enlightenment in many different parts of the world, this would have seemed like a very strange way to, to understand the world. So I think that these, um, these modern discoveries in the fungal sciences, this, these modern um, discoveries, in, discoveries in the microbial sciences more generally, take us back into a kind of holistic interconnected picture um, that, was, that was actually, this is probably a very ancient one for humans. Uh, so I see this as a kind of remembering Do you want to continue, Georges, to say something? Okay. One of the things that I realized also in this connection in technology, which I think Merlin was talking about here, it's interesting, is that we are able to perceive the potential of fungi in this place where the construction can use fungi. You could imagine fungi producing light like bioluminescent fungi produce imagining them in this construction even parts or utensils in human day to human life and we would be able to 
work with this and conduct or live with this, it's a great lesson. Uh, we need humility to be able to learn from it and at the same time, depth and of attention to be able to understand the degree to which it's possible. I think that just imagine technology that's a, making progress to copy intelligence from mushrooms as technology from the fungi to imagine that to sustain this structure here that uses so little space. What else could we imagine from mushrooms? Why can't we copy this to benefit from it in a, a different view and interaction? It's a place that I think is fantastic to take that view, the degree to which development that we are have focused on looking at this. This is fantastic. It is a lot of subject matter. I could listen for hours to both of you. I think that there's something in common in your personal stories for each of you. George, his father uh, launched agroforestry in Merlin and his father who already studied microbiology and his relations. It's somewhat different than what we had access to thus far concerning the plant world. So I'd like to know how you two would say that this affected your work and whatever else you'd like to say about this relationship. Um, well, I found that growing up in a household with a, a father who is a, a very um, brilliant student of the living world. He is um, fascinated and curious and full of wonder about the other life, um, well, all life going on around us. And so me and my brother were encouraged to take an interest in the lives of those organisms uh, around us. And this made a big impact. And we spent a lot of time outside. We spent a lot of time inside um, looking at things down microscopes, you know, um, looking at tadpoles changing into frogs and keeping pets and um, doing all sorts of things and so this for sure nourished my interest in the living world and um, encouraged me to to um, think more broadly about what it is that we think of by life what it is that we think of by relationship um, to see the study of biology not just as a study of the physical organisms out there, but is in some sense also philosophy, the study of ideas, the study of different ways of understanding the world. Um, and so I, I feel very grateful to have, um, to have experienced this. Um, what a beautiful story. It's fantastic when we are proud of the story, our paternal and maternal story. I have deep admiration for both my parents and my interest, it emerged precisely to continue a family story because my father always told me the story of my grandfather and I took interest in my grandfather as well in his life story and not imposed on me, but a very uh, loving way and a human way, being a human connected to our roots and origins of the stories. And human history is connected to the environment. It's very connected to harmony, human harmony, and the environment where humans live. And this permaculture to keep family culture alive, we have to understand plants around us, the medicines, and fruits around us. So all of this, it's not a dependence, but this interaction, this symbiosis existed between us as a family in the middle, in the heart of the Atlantic forest where we were three kilometers from a megalopolis and we didn't have electricity. We didn't have a refrigerator. We didn't have external contact with the outer world. I had to take full advantage of this forest environment and, and that was it. My friends were my brothers. My laboratory was the forest. My school was my mother. My mother taught me to read and write. 
and my father taught me agroforestry. I had to learn how to plant yams, process the yams, manioc and everything, and to study in the afternoon with my mother, looking at the forest and the agroforestry and the love. There was no separation between myself. There was no separation between my person and that environment. We are one organism, a single organism. So every day I feel like this more and more and the fungi taught me much more even this interaction. And it really changed when I approached fungi. There was something very different in my family history because it was like to touch on a subject that my father never stopped looking at my mother, my siblings, my grandparents, nobody had ever approached fungi as much as I had. And now it's been amazing, this relationship and admiration, the famous admiration for the work in the research of the fungi. It's amazing. They're so open to it and their admiration to have a topic which is new in the family. Fungi are a new subject, having a special view of this uh, fungal kingdom. And now it's it was always the plant, but the common thing in this family thing was the love for the environment and biodiversity and ecosystem and respect, mutual, profound mutual respect. I think that we extended this answer. I'd like to ask how this learning process of each of you, how you would describe that this affected your way of living uh, of each of you. You can, can you tell us that? Yes, so um, I mean, thinking about fungi has made my, uh, surely has changed my life. And um, thinking about the living world changes the way that I live, the way that I feel, the way that I think. Um, and the more deeply that I observe other life forms, the more deeply that I try to understand other life forms, um, the more that I find myself changed in the process. And um, just as an example, there are many ways this happens, but um, thinking about the ways that organisms relate to one another, symbiosis, for example, um, mutually beneficial symbiotic relationships, which are, when we think of interrelationships, it's easy to think of one organism uh, and another organism, and then a kind of connection between them, um, as if these two things were separate from each other, and all they needed to have was just a, a join, a connection made between them. But in most symbiotic relationships, it's much more entwined than that it's a bit like there's a there's a drawing by the artist mc escher of drawing hands one hand is drawing the other and the other hand is drawing the other at the same time and it's a bit like this with um many symbiotic relationships where um the relationship the, the two entities emerge out of their relationship they don't exist prior to their relationship um, and so thinking about this really changes the way that i i engage with organisms that i encounter every day, for example, the plants that I eat um, from you know, every day, I, I think of plants now, not just as isolated individuals, but as organisms which farm fungi and uh, fungi as organisms which farm plants, and together they create this visible body of the plant that I eat that I consume. Uh, but really, the plant is just a visible expression of uh, a relationship involving fungi, uh, and that what we call plants wouldn't have existed and have evolved if they had not struck up relationships with fungi 500 million years ago. And so this changes just the, the, the way that I, I perceive and I know um, the organisms in, in, in my everyday life. It's just one example, but there are many others. Bom, uh, Great. In my life, I think that Fungi changed as a gatherer, I gather. The main thing was that I was encouraged with this challenge to be a gatherer. I say that I'm much more of a, I'm a, more a gatherer than a farmer because of the fact that I understand that there is so much abundance. And when I used to walk and farm, I just, looked for plants and now I choose the path. I'm looking for plants and fungi. So my view expanded greatly and I was much more sensitive. I became much more sensitive and perhaps deeper as well. Not, not only 
the green and the colors, but also details that are hidden in the forest. And I realized that I became more alert because every day I want to taste new flavors, fungal flavors and tastes. I've become more and more curious that this has totally changed my relationship with farming and with life in the field because in the countryside, because that's it. I'm much, uh, the food, I'm in the, I was very focused on the food side of things. I still am today. And the fungi brought this broad feeling of what was missing for me in my agriculture for my life as a gatherer, this business of gathering mushrooms. It was really magic for me. It changed a lot of things for me. It's fantastic. And I believe continuing, George, since you talked about gathering, because oftentimes we think that when you talk about gathering, we think you have to be in a farm, you have to be in a minimally rural environment. And you were the one who taught me and provoked me and urged me to begin to observe this in urban spaces as long as possible. It is possible to find many of these mushrooms, the wild mushrooms and food, edible mushrooms in these urban environments. So I'd like to ask a continuing question whether cultivating these mushrooms and consuming them, if you think that it is one of the paths for us to begin to value the universe of fungi more and more and appreciate it more. Certainly, we need to take great care. We're talking about a kingdom with still a process of discovery, no matter how the degree to which they inhabit amongst us, there's a history of being a mushroom gatherer, especially in Brazil, it's not widespread. There's an abundance of wealth. They're present everywhere not only in the forest, but uh, people think that they only exist in the forest and the cities are full of them and full of mushrooms and development growing and, and blossoming and decomposing organic matter. The path is to food diversification and enrichment of our daily diet. So how can we think of this as a way of generating Nutrition, human nutrition. We have a shortage of nutrition. We think about nutrients coming from the animal kingdom. We base our diet much on this. We to, one of the ways to change the planet and to bring much more balance rather than having more pastures and wood. We should have wood to produce mushrooms and be a more spontaneous gathering and harvesting in the urban areas. I've gathered numerous mushrooms in the cities as well, edible ones. So I believe in this potential and I'm certain that I provoke this tension in people and I provoke people to reflect on this. It's possible to practice this, practice this study, not just be a gather for consumption, but for research. You don't have to go out to the forest to practice mushroom gathering. To awaken this view is important anywhere you are. They're present amongst us. They're always amongst us the mushrooms. They're here in my t-shirt, on my computer, on the camera, everywhere. They're abundant and they go unnoticed. So awaken this view as a path and this working with urban expeditions to study biodiversity in cities in the large Brazilian metropolises, Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. We have to do that to awaken, not just for consumption, but for study to appreciate and value the knowledge of this bio, magnificent biodiversity. This species here, which I brought here, which is beautiful to see. It's Favelos brasiliensis. It is extremely abundant in cities, highly abundant. It's one of the richest, it's tasty and nutritious and very abundant as well. One of your favorite ones, apparently. One of my favorite mushrooms, definitely. That's fantastic. And picking up on this point, to ask Merlin the reason for his having chosen the Panamanian tropical forest to do his research, which is in his book. 
Well, the main reason I went was because there's a research station there called the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. Um, and it's got really fantastic facilities. So it's quite, it's not a very exciting reason for choosing this place, but it's a, uh, it, the result is very exciting. Um, so it's, um, when doing certain types of research, you need certain types of facility. You know, I need minus 80 freezers. I need liquid nitrogen, fresh liquid nitrogen. I need ultra pure tanks of, nit um, of gaseous nitrogen, uh, whatever. These, um, these things which would be difficult to find in some more remote areas of forest in the tropics. And so one of the reasons was because of the facilities. Uh, another reason, which was um, a re not the reason why I chose to go, but one of the reasons why um, I came to really treasure my time there was because there are so many other ecologists and field biologists who also go to this institute for the same reasons that I go to this institute. Um, and so there's an, a, a rich, uh, bustling community of researchers who are studying different aspects of the forest. And so there's a lot that you can learn from these other researchers um, about what they're studying, but also how they study. Um, and they have different perspectives. You know, the people who study bats, they follow the bats. Um, they go out at night, they learn the habits of the bats. People who study the monkeys follow the monkeys. Now, I study the fungi in the soil, so I spend my time with my hands in the soil, digging, you know, scraping um, soil into tubes or digging holes. Or um, So we all experience the forest in very different ways. And when you share your experience together, when you talk about these different experiences of the forest, it builds a much richer um, picture. And so I learned a lot from being in, in, in a, an imaginative and creative community of, of, of researchers, um, as well as having access to uh, excellent uh, facilities. It's an amazing wealth of experience. And we received a question here in, from the audience, which has a lot to do with what you have already mentioned. I'd like you to tell us a little bit more about this. It was from Artu Macedo. He asked, how do you deal with this diverse way form of existence and the limits of our language to understand this. Do you think of the poetics of the fungi or the poetry of the mushrooms? Merlin, would you like to take that one? So, yes, I mean, when I try to um... When I try to understand their lives, then there are all sorts of problems that we run into. Um, it's very clear when you start to investigate using, say, DNA sequencing or, or other types of um, technique that allow you to find out who lives where in the soil, um, that these techniques are very crude, really, and that you have to kill the organisms that you're trying to study uh, in order to work out what they're doing. Um, so there's a kind of destructive part uh, of these inquiries. And this is a normal thing for biologists. I mean, bi many biologists kill the organisms that they try to study um, before they can study them. And it's, it's, it's one of the paradoxes of biology, you know, that, that a lot of the time biologists to understand life have to take life away. Uh, not always, of course. Um, but um, there are all sorts of obstacles and barriers to inquiry that, that, that these, um, these difficulties present. And, um, and so there's a lot of need for imagination. There's a lot of need for, uh, I think, um, metaphor and analogy uh, and, and poetry. Um, these are, when, we, when we think of poetry, when we think of metaphor and analogy, we're really thinking about, I think, the very basic ways that we perceive, the very basic ways that we know. Um, imagination is so fundamental to the way that we engage with our senses. Um, I think of imagination more like um, the romantics thought about imagine, imagination is a basic faculty of perception, not that imagination is um, when you imagine something that it's false, that it's not really there, um, but that imagination is key to knowing and understanding and perceiving. And, um, and so I think imagination is very important for all forms of scientific inquiry, but particularly when you have um, 
lots of difficulties, when, particularly when your techniques don't let you get as far as you want to. Um, so yes, I spent a lot of time thinking about uh, how I could picture the lives of fungi, how I could um, find my way into the underground worlds of the soil based on the evidence that I had, but also not limited to the evidence I had, because if I was just limited to the evidence I had, then I would be treating the soil um, like a, a schematic, schematic mechanical robotic place, and I know that it is not that. Fantastic. For me, I'm not exactly part of academia. I'm not part of formal sciences. I'm actually a parabotanist. I'm autonomous and self-taught in this sense. The great challenge for me in the science side or molecular side, I don't have access to normally. I take the path of empiricism and ethno reclaiming the history in which I have a tradition that someone uses the way the people is studying the way that people use the fungi The challenge is the place, but the step and the milestone for me it used to be a bigger challenge was creating networks, webs of people and connections, people who are in Brazil, in academia and part of science who can bring me the language and also methods which facilitate which facilitate my understanding. So although I have a limitation in the understanding of the scientific language, I attempt to ask questions that are much more intuitive for scientists and attempt to hear their interpretation that comes from a more technical language, but we are able to reach the same place, a common place in daily practice in that place where understanding out in the field is it's the same thing. It's truly to harmonize and reconcile the feeling for life that's functioning for what is happening organically, for what is, is gonna happen even if, whether I'm there or not, if I understand it or not. So this place is extremely important. It's the simplicity amongst the two sciences. And I thank my great friends for this who have exactly the, the total understanding what this, that, and the others, these networks these beings and bring me this more technical form and at the same time there's a very intuitive side and connecting to the beings and understand more this place of the view the scientific view and not necessarily the place of the grand science with a capital s both together uh, give us greater power it's magic i think complementing I had had the opportunity to accompany George in these moments, and he appears to be communicate, be communicating to these beings in some way, as far as I understand it. What you brought very quickly now is how science helps when we're talking in scientific terms, oftentimes because of the lack of the common names for the fungi, the mushrooms, and how this sensitivity, intuitive empirical sensitivity that you have of knowing where they're going to be sprout. I've seen you doing this. I've seen you walking and you stop out of the clear blue sky and you turn and you find a trunk and it's full of mushrooms. So it's awesome and empirical. I think it's fantastic. This combination of these two worlds. So you want to talk a little bit more about this, George, and I have another question for Merlin as well. Okay, so that's exactly it. When I normally enter the place of nature and the forest and biodiversity in this context, I try to be as minimal to be much more, put myself in the place of a sensitivity, more in sensitivity than rationality. But on the other hand, this is poetic and practical terms. I count on support from the forest for this and not put them in my mouth or take acts that are risky. I go with people that give me this basis. And now on 4th and 5th of December, I'm going to be with Nelson Minoli, who's a Brazilian researcher, mycologist, who did the translation of Merlin's book even here into Brazilian Portuguese. And this is this person, I've relied on him for years already. 
this place for us to join forces because I'm always in the forest and he's always in his laboratory. This has huge power to humans, to human beings with the fungi, the mushrooms, this magic being. They combined us together to dream and to produce fantastic things for Brazil, for the world, where one is in the middle of the forest all the time and the other is proving this n times, oftentimes through the laboratory. So this place for me, this intersection, it used to be challenging and now it's a great solution and it gives us great power. And I'm extremely happy, obviously, and extremely happy to be able to rely on this kind of support. I'm talking his own on his behalf, but I could cite others. There's a group, a collective already, a group, a WhatsApp group with people that are that love mushrooms, and this is the path. That's the path where humility in this sum of forces where we are equals. When we enter the forest to understand the biodiversity, we have to be equal to the forest and equal to our friends, our brothers. We have to be humble in that sense. It's a human, it's human micella, right? Incredible. Merlin, you're also a musician, is that correct? And you have this experience like outside of the academia. I'd like to know from you, your study of Micella, how it influences your music. Could you talk a little bit about your music, your Micella music as well? Well, I was brought up in a household where music was just something that humans did. You know, it was like a bodily function. You eat and you sleep, how you play music. It's just a basic part of being alive. And um, so it informs much more of my life than just my academic practice. It's just part of how I understand life. Um, but I think it's very helpful, actually, to, under to think, of, think musically about uh, the living world um, when we're thinking about biological subjects, because uh, music is a process in time. You can't have music at an instant. Um, that would not be music. Music has to unfold in time. And so does life. We think about organisms um, and different parts of the world as things, even rocks as things. Uh, but everything is in fact a process. Uh, molecules are um, collections of atoms, um, but you break it all down. And what we're talking about is energy moving within fields. This is all processual. It's not hard, rigid stuff. And so um, everything is unfolding in time. Um, everything is a process. The whole universe is a process and, and all of life forms are a process. If you think about in your body, the cells that make up your body today, the, the molecules that make up your cells today, those are different molecules to the molecules that make, made up your cells a few years ago. So you're a kind of field of stability through which matter is passing. And so, and this is a very old idea. Um, this is, goes all the way back um, to the pre-Socratic philosophers, particularly Heraclitus, the Greek philosopher, but uh, it's a very old intuition, uh, even older, I'm sure, than that. Um, so music, I find, reminds me of this processual nature of life, the processual nature of reality. Um, and it takes me out of my temptation to think about the world as made up of things, of fixed unchanging substances. And, and so for me, this is just one way that it, it leads me into a more dynamic engagement with, um, with the lives around me. And I find it very helpful uh, for these reasons. Beautiful. We are close to the end of our conversation. We have a few more questions from the audience and one more question here. And I believe that I would like to begin by starting to draw to a close by asking how, let me ask a little question first. How mushroom life, fungal life provokes us to imagine how to solve this crisis that we're living on the planet, this climate crisis, and 
what's going to be the form of life for the near future we have ahead of us. If you would like to talk a little bit about that. Okay, I believe I don't have an, a concrete answer, such a concrete, solid answer. Perhaps technology and science of the micella will teach us how we should behave and perhaps how to use this technology and science for our human living condition on this planet. Perhaps it's more that than exactly that is going to save us. We need to understand this in order to be able to have a less impact on the environment and heat uh, generate less impact. I think that's the path, in my opinion, understanding the science and technology of interaction and connectivity. And of course, how it is able to take all the matter that we produce all the way from plastic, glass, everything that how they can decompose so many structures they are they promise life a guarantee of human life but we need to be more simple and simpler and more humble humbler to look at more seriously at this to generate less inputs as waste and behave more in a more integrated way that's the reality otherwise we're going to put all the responsibility on somebody else and will continue to practice the same unpleasant and disrespectful acts. We need to be much more respectful with the planet and of course, to be able to be present in it for more millennia. Yeah, I agree. Um, <clears throat> I think that there are, um, there are so many ways uh, that we need to change, to adapt, um, to adjust our, our philosophies, our behaviors, our intuitions, um, our relationships. Um, but I think one of the ways that Funky can help us uh, and the microbial world more generally is that it leads us into a view of um, life as fundamentally uh, one of relationship. I think a lot of the problems that we have, a lot of the disrespectful behavior that we engage in, a lot of the ecocidal behavior that we engage in, comes, it's rooted in a, a false understanding of humans as separable from each other and from the rest of the living world. Um, so it doesn't matter what we do over here because that's not us, that's not our problem. So if we start to change that and come back to an idea of um, uh, of, of life as relationship fundamentally, then um, it becomes much harder to justify this kind of destructive, degrading, um, disrespectful um, behavior. And so I think Fungi can lead us into a more interconnected worldview uh, and a more um, profound um, and um, a humble relationship with the rest of the living world also and there are other ways uh, that we could talk about it but that's just one to 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 um to add i could listen for hours forever i'd like to be connected with like the micella like we're hyphy but we have very little time. So we're gonna to need to close now. I'm going to turn the floor over to you for your final remarks. And I wanna thank you from the bottom of my heart, both of you for inspiring us so much with your work that each of you does in these spheres to say how much I admire you and how important it is. I think that we're still gonna discover more about the micellar world and universe and to learn much from the micella. So you can feel free to make your final remarks. Georges, you wanna begin? Okay, since we're reaching the end, we're saying farewell already. So it was special to be able to share this love for fungi, it's not just a profession, far from it. It's a, 
inner love and passion that my cella vibrate, seeking this interconnection, this way of being more respectful and more alert. What inspires me is to see how many people are already connected now and are connecting more and more with this attention to the fungal kingdom, which promises, doesn't promise, it is. When we understand it, you can see that they are the ones that make the web and the entangled life that unite and process our existence. So we need increasingly to use this in our daily acts and practices to talk much more to kids, to tell people about, and kids about this magic. It's not just playful magic that it doesn't exist. It's not just imagination, it's practical. So we have to talk to the kids about this. I have three children myself, so I talk to them a lot. I know that this dedication that we have is dedication to education. This more sensitive way is a path to glimpse in 40 years from now, something that's gonna change a lot the direction of the human journey. So I'm inspired and I feel every day happier and happier and nourished to be able to hear and share experiences. So I wanna thank also Merlin Sheldrick for his life story is inspiring for us. His inspirations are fantastic. They're nourishing to guarantee that these micella will grow and flourish bearing fruit. That's the word. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me. It's been an honor to be here. Um, and thank you, Jorge, for your stories. And I hope one day, maybe when I come to Brazil, we might be able to meet and to talk in person and to maybe go in the forest. Um, and um, I would love to learn from you about the, um, the plants and fungi that, um, that live around your area and that you know so well. Um, and um, I agree that it's so important that we integrate fungi within education, um, educational programs that children um, are taught about fungi and that their and their relationships and their roles uh, in the living world. At the moment, they're quite neglected, and this is a problem. Uh, it's also important, I think, that we integrate fungi within conservation frameworks. Most international conservation frameworks refer to plants and animals but not to fungi. And this is a problem because obviously plants and animals would not be able to do what they do without the fungi that allow them to do that. So broadening of our uh, understanding of the living world to include fungi within conservation frameworks and educational frameworks, um, increase the amount of fungal research and, uh, and enthusiasm. Um, I think all of these are very important um, for us to do and, and are happening, um, are definitely taking place. And so I have, I have hope. And um, so I wish you all well and Thanks. Thanks again. Então, é com vontade de continuar escutando. We wish we could continue to listen to these two teachers, but I'm adjourning, closing. I want to thank the audience, everyone who's here with us. Would also love to continue listening to them, and let's hope that very soon we'll have an opportunity. Meanwhile, Georges has his experiences going on in experiments basically in, in all throughout Brazil, both in Paraty and elsewhere in Brazil. He's traveled around Brazil and Merlin Sheldrake launching his book now, an award-winning book with other awards and articles that he's published. He just published an article yesterday in uh, newspapers. So we're following the work by these two great extravagant and amazing uh, people who are so knowledgeable uh, fungi. So thank you all.